Thank you for coming. Um, in this talk, I want to tell you the story of how we went from supporting one main development platform, that is Java, and to support at least three uh, as of now and more are coming, and how we did this without rebuilding uh, most of our infrastructure and while maintaining uh, native ergonomics with respect to tooling. All right, uh, but before we start, I, I just want to get a show of hands, although I feel kind of stupid asking this. Uh, do we have any Docker users here? <laughs> All right, that's perfect. So less explaining to do on my end. Um, developers or DevOps people? Also, perfect. All right, so we have a good mix. It will be interesting, I think, for everyone. Let me start by giving you a little background about how Netflix started out that will help us understand the rest of the presentation. Uh, Netflix started out in 1997 in the DVD shipping business. Now, I haven't personally done it myself, but you could go on a website, basically pick whatever movie you wanted to watch. Uh, that movie would then be physically sent to your home where you could watch it on your DVD player. Uh, and then when you were done watching it, you'd had, you basically had to send it back to Netflix so they could send you more uh, DVDs. And back then, in 97, um, we didn't really have the cloud, we didn't really have all the microservices, buzzwords. And so, like many other companies, Netflix started with a monolithic Java app off of a data center, <clears throat> off of a data center. Uh, using an Oracle database. And I know for some of you, the, some of these words might even border on, on dirty at this point, uh, but that's the way it was in 97. And if you look at the open source offering that Netflix has today, you might be tempted to think that we continue to be JVM-centric. Uh, we have, as an example, we have Nebula here on the top left, uh, which is our suite of Gradle plugins they are written in Java, in Groovy, and Kotlin, so all JVM. Uh, we have Spinnaker, which is our open source uh, deployment platform, also written using the same languages. And so are the rest of the, those um, open source projects. Uh, but in reality, if you actually dive into the analytics we did for our code base, you see that we've actually turned polyglot over the years. Uh, if we dive specifically into Java, Scala, and Groovy, you see that they still compose maybe 50 or close to 50% 50, 50 of the code base. But then we also have a pretty big blob here of JavaScript and Node. Um, I'm estimating closer to 40% at this point, but this is certainly more than uh, just a few projects. And then in addition to that, we also have uh, Python tooling that's very popular with our data scientists. Um, I'm not really sure why, but this is the language of choice for data people. And then our Ruby community, which is also gr growing very fast, even exponentially, I would say, in popularity within our studio in the cloud effort. This is an, also an ever-expanding team, and we're using more and more Ruby. So we want to ask the question, how did this happen? How do we return from mainly a JVM centric company to a company that has so many languages or so many platforms. And we think we, there are basically two main reasons of why that happened. First of all, it has a lot to do with the culture. Uh, one of the main, one of the core values that we have at Netflix is called freedom and responsibility. What it means is that every team is free to choose whatever technology, whatever platform makes sense to them uh, and if that specific technology is not supported by a central team, then they also have the responsibility uh, to support it themselves. We feel, uh, as a company, and we feel very strongly about this, that this really increases the rate of innovation and reduces drag. You basically get to choose whatever technology you want, you just run with it and deploy your stuff. The second thing that might have caused this is that in 2008, we moved from the, or started migrating from the data center to the Amazon cloud. And in the process, we started pulling out pieces from that monolith into microservices. And once you have microservices, it's virtually uh, very simple to basically throw out the existing code and um, to replace it with another language you want to experiment with or you feel is more appropriate. 
That said, we also have the concept of a paved road. And that's actually where my team, developer productivity, comes into the picture. What we do is we try to find the road most traveled, and we build uh, best practices and some tooling around it to streamline it and make it more accessible to the other teams that follow suit. And because the paved road is really the, the path of least resistance for most teams, most things just work, I think it's safe to say that most teams stay on it or at least very close to it as much as they can because otherwise they, they're going to have to pay the price later in kind of catching up with the rest of Netflix. So what does that paver look like? Basically, we see it as five different stages of development. And those stages of development are not really dissimilar from, I think, many other companies out there. First of all, we need to initialize the project. Uh, and by initialize, I mean we need to create the, the Git repo. Uh, we use Bitbucket, the Jenkins uh, jobs for, for continuous integration. We need to uh, create the Spinnaker pipeline for deployment, and then also set up the alerts and metrics on top of Atlas. There are many other um, components in the process, but for the purpose of this talk, I really want to focus just on these ones because these are more related to the actual development. Next, we start developing the code. Once we have all the infrastructure in place, uh, we want to resolve dependencies, we want to build the code, we want to run tests. Uh, most of our engineers use Gradle, but we, as we saw, we actually have a lot of Node developers as well, so they would use NPM and Node, uh, and some of them have already migrated to Yarn. We have SBT for Scala, and we have many, many others. Next, once we push the code um, onto Git, we need to run continuous integration or CI on it. For internal projects, we use Jenkins. For external projects, we usually use Travis in most cases. And in some edge cases, we also build inside of small uh, builder images in Docker. Usually that's the case for, um, for C++ projects or projects that have system level dependencies that we cannot otherwise have on our Jenkins slaves. And then finally, when we're happy with the result and the build is passed, uh, we want to package the, the artifacts into a deployable unit. At Netflix, what we do is we, we package everything into Debian packages. And what we do later with those packages is we take them and we bake them on top of our base Amazon, Amazon machine image. And that becomes our deployable unit. All right, but the important thing that the builds need to produce is a Debian package. And then finally, uh, this is a swamp up, so we need to mention Artifactory as well. We publish it uh, to our binary repository, which is Artifactory. We have Artifactory in-house. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, we end up with a pretty standard uh, development pipeline. We initialize, we build, or develop, we run CI, we package, and we publish. And because historically Netflix has been mostly focused on the JVM, we have provided tooling to developers um, using the Gradle platform. So when we ask developers to build their projects, we tell them, you need to download the Nebula distribution of Gradle. This is our Gradle, internal Gradle distribution that comes with all the plugins pre-installed. And you need to run the build. Uh, and then when they want to package the thing into a Debian, we tell them you can use our OS package plugin, which comes in the same distribution in Gradle that takes artifacts or source code and makes it into a Debian file. And then finally, to publish, what we do is we use the Artifactory Gradle plugin, and together with some wiring code around credentials and some metadata files, uh, we basically push to Artifactory. So, if this is something that you find interesting, there's actually a, a really good Medium blog post out there that uh, you could read more about. It basically mentions everything I, I said today, but also dives into how we do baking and how we do uh, deployments. So feel free to check it out. And I think I'll, I'll probably send out a presentation later on so you don't have to worry about copying it. So back to our deployment pipeline for Polyglot developers. Is what we have good enough? Do we feel a Ruby developer would be happy with having a build Gradle in their workspace uh, and to go, through, to go through Gradle and Java 
to do all the Ruby builds and deployments? And I think the answer is, eh, not really. Uh, then there are a couple of reasons for it. First of all, it's very, very error prone, and we've seen this time and time again. Our Ruby developers are, in fact, all over none JVM developers don't typically have to use Gradle when they come into Netflix. And as a result, it means they need to, um, they need to learn the syntax, they need to install Java, they need to find out the integration points between Gradle and their native tooling. Um, and because it's, it's like a back and forth process with a tool that they haven't used before, it's very error prone and it takes a lot longer than it actually should. And that kind of takes me to the second um, problem, which is bad user experience. You basically end up with a build Gradle and a gem file for Ruby or a package JSON for Node, and it's just a mishmash of things that might appear uh, a bit over the top. Um, you can contrast it with the way Heroku works or other platforms that really only have a single configuration file and that's it. Uh, and lastly, and maybe even most importantly, it's really a lengthy process. We mentioned that we need to uh, initialize Stash, and we need to initialize Jenkins, and we need to initialize Spinnaker and get all the metrics right, and then we have to think about all the webhooks that need to be configured between all of them. And it's very easy to forget, it's very easy to misconfigure, especially in an environment where everything changes all the time. Um, I, I can tell you from my experience that when I had to do this the first time, I followed the wiki, the wiki page, and I followed all the steps to the letter, and I still got it wrong, simply because the wiki was not up to date, but I'm sure you all share a very similar experience. <laughs> all right, so our users wanted, or actually they demanded, more native tooling and little boilerplate. They didn't wanna have to go through all of our JVM tooling. So how did we fix it? We basically had to realize two things. First of all, all platforms share a common life cycle. What that means is that it doesn't matter if you're Ruby or Node or Python, you always have to go through these five steps, right? You always have to initialize, build, integrate, package, and publish. And basically, the API between those different stages is defined, or in other words, we know for every stage what the input is, we know what the output is, and then something needs to be done. Right, to get it done. Up until now, we've done it through Gradle, but there must be a better way. The second thing we realize is, is that every project comes with its own unique metadata. And by metadata, I mean stuff like the project, the project system level dependencies and the uh, package name or the package version, how to build a project, that sort of stuff. So that's usually only unique to the project. That's not something that we can say is global to all the projects. And with that in mind, we built NEWT, which stands for Netflix Workflow Toolkit. And believe it or not, we actually have another app that's responsible for coming up with these names, I kid you not. Uh, so it's pretty cool, it's very useful. So what is NEWT? Newt is a multi-platform command line interface tool that manages the application lifecycle. And it's quite a mouthful, but in reality, it's really very simple. What it does is it's a single tool that runs from the root of your workspace. It's got a single configuration file, very similar to how Gradle or Maven work. Um, and it can basically run your application lifecycle steps for you. So you could run Newt init or Newt package or Newt publish, all right? That's really all it is. The cool thing about Newt, though, is that each one of those stages, each one of those steps is executed in an isolated Docker container. And since we all know what Docker is, I'm not gonna dive into the definition. I had this here just in case um, I had to review it. But the important thing about Docker, I think, is that it runs on all the different platforms. It used to only run well on Linux, but now it runs really good on Mac and on Windows as well. So let's see an example of what that means in the world of Newt. When you run Newt init dash dash app type and the app type, Newt does two things. First of all, it makes sure that you have uh, Docker installed on your system. If you're on a Mac, it uses Homebrew to install it. If you use Linux, it uses apt. Um, 
we still haven't done it for Windows, but in Windows, I'm, I'm sure it would be something similar. And basically, once it installs Docker for you, it goes to the Docker registry and downloads the Docker that we have pre-built for that specific phase, for that specific stage. Uh, in our case, for the, the init container on, for Rails, we have the node and NPM tooling. We have Yeoman, which is a code generator, and then our static generator and some wiring code that basically runs the whole thing. What then ends up happening with Newt is it takes the metadata it has on the project, puts it into the container, runs it, and then the container, because it has been pre-configured to initialize the project, um, creates all the things, again, Stash, Jenkins, Spinnaker, events, and so on, uh, and then basically just goes away. Uh, and the important thing to note here is that you never had to have any of those tooling inst tools installed on your computer. You basically just had to have Newt. Newt would download all the things, run them, and be disposed of them. Is this actually better than what we had before? We think it is. First of all, if you just compare the time it takes to build or to run that step, there is a massive difference. Uh, instead of having to manually run all the steps or to download the tooling and make sure you have the right versions and the right command, you basically just run a single command that downloads all the things for you, executes, and exits. This is much, much faster. That's a huge productivity boost for us. In fact, one of our teams, um, at Netflix has complained to us that it took them more than two days to set up a single application up in the air. And I'm talking about a microservice, not, not a monolith. And the reason was because they had so much infrastructure to set up and a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of configuration or a lot of plumbing in between those services. And now it has gone down from two days to as low as five minutes. And that's even for people who have never used Mute before. So that's very considerable already. Uh, the second thing is that it's less error prone. Because the, the container comes to the box um, pre-made and ready to go, and the set of parameters that it can accept from Newt is very finite, we can then validate the parameters on Newt. We send those parameters onto the container, and the container, because it has a very specific API, it knows what it can get, it knows what it needs to output, it's very easy to test. So it's less error prone, given the, the known set of parameters that we can send to it. Another thing that's also very interesting is that we now have a single tool to do all development across Netflix. Um, if before our Rails developers had to uh, install the Rails tooling, or so that would be a Ruby version manager, and then Gradle and Java. That would be a fairly lengthy process, multiple tooling, and you'd also have to worry about versioning and making sure you have the latest tools. With Newt, you basically have a single tool that updates itself all the time and makes sure you have the right versions of everything. And we think it's a big deal, especially when it comes to maintenance and making sure that developers are up to date. Let's see another example of what that means. So as you recall, uh, at Netflix, we ask our developers to package their artifacts into Debian's, which we later bake onto the, the base Amazon machine image. And to do that, we now ask them to run Newt package. Newt package now gets a different container with a different set of tools. This time it uses uh, the, a Java uh, runtime, the Nebula suite of plugins, a Gradle, the Gradle distribution, and some wiring code. And then this container is pre-configured to know to take artifacts. And once you run it with the container, it just produces a Debian. And I think the cool thing about this to notice is that how we actually create the Debian becomes an implementation detail. And that's an important bit, and I think it's worth highlighting again. Why is that important? Why is the fact that this is an implementation detail important? First of all, we basically lower the cognitive load on our developers significantly. They don't have to worry about installing tools. They don't have to worry about how the thing gets packaged. All they need to know is new package does the right thing. And they know that the, the parameters that they send through new will, will be validated and correct. So, or in other words, uh, what we do is we uh, take away the undifferentiated heavy lifting from our developers. We allow them to focus on the code, to focus on what actually matters, and we take away all the stuff that is really just plumbing. Um, secondly, 
because we've abstracted away this implementation detail and we have a, a defined API, uh, we can now reuse this across the different platforms. So now that we have a container that uses Gradle to package a build or to package a, an artifact, we, we can use this now in Rails and in, in, um, in Node and in Python. It's all the same for us. For us, it's just bits. So to do a quick recap, we basically saw the, the development pipeline, and now we understand that in it can be delegated onto a container uh, that has Yeoman and all the scaffolding, uh, and basically does all the scaffolding for you. Next, we now uh, see that we can also run CI directly from Newt. We can basically delegate our code or send our code directly to a Docker container or a builder that is pre-configured with all the build tools. Run it, whether it's successful or not, and return. And again, make all the, the, the builder container disappear from your system. You don't even have to have it. And it would work identically, either, you know, whether it runs on your computer, someone else's computer, or on Jenkins. It's a container. And then package and publish would be using the container that comes with Nebula and Gradle, but again, it's just an implementation detail. It's really, it really doesn't matter as far as Newt is concerned. So we're left with the development phase. How do we do this? And we'll address this in the next slide. Basically, the biggest question or the biggest challenge we had at this point was, how do we provide a native feel for writing non-JVM apps when you have to go through Newt? How does that work? We didn't want them to learn new commands. We didn't want them to, to use something that they're not used to. So uh, a Ruby developer would want to, use to continue, would want to continue to use uh, Bundler and Gems and Nodes. Node developers would want to use um, NPM and Node. So what we did to solve this was to introduce a new command that we call Newt exec. What this does is it goes to the configuration file. It checks to see what version of the tool you intend to work with. It bootstraps it for you into your system, kind of like um, NVM or RVM or RBN, if you guys are familiar, uh, work. And then it passes on all the parameters you sent onto the tool. So as far as the developer is concerned, this is exactly the same as they worked before with the exception of Newt exec before. Now, in fact, we can change this, and we have for some of our developers by aliasing node to Newt exec node. What happens then is whenever you run node, Newt starts up, it tries to see, do I have a configuration in here that I can work with? If not, it just delegates to the system node. If yes, then it bootstraps the right version of Node, and then the developer works as if you know, it, w it were native Node and Newt was even, wasn't even in the picture. So, so far, this is what we had planned, uh, and it's been working pretty well for a lot of our app types. But in the process of deploying this and experimenting with a few of the teams, we found that there are many other advantages that come as a result of using Docker for basically abstracting development phases. Well, first of all, we now know that users are always guaranteed to have the latest tooling because Newt always goes to the Docker registry and gets the latest container that has been approved. We now know they always use the latest tooling and that's a very big thing, especially for a central team like ours that basically needs to chase down other teams and make sure they have the, the latest tooling and the latest runtimes. This is just uh, a fix out of the box that we don't have to worry about anymore. The second thing is that maintenance of those tooling now becomes central. If the container works for one developer, it's very likely that it's gonna work for everyone else. If it doesn't work for one developer, unfortunately it also means it probably doesn't work for everyone else, but that, then it also means that we're very fast to respond because we get feedback straight away. It's not gonna be some edge case that only happens on some machine in some other universe that, that's hard to replicate. So that's very, very good in terms of uh, time to respond and also in, in terms of um, the fact that we have a central team that now controls it and makes sure that it's, it's working well and that machinery is working. Another great advantage that we found out was that we now have centralized metrics for everything. 
we can now know what app types are being built and how often. We know what errors users are experiencing. We know how long each of those stages takes. We know uh, if there's one preferred method to use the tool over another. And when we have those metrics, we have a much better understanding of how users work. Now we can better serve them. If you recall, our paved road is exactly about that, finding out what people are actually doing and optimizing their experience. So that has been a great experience for us. And finally, although that's probably not as important for Netflix, because Newt and Docker run everywhere, Newt is a Go binary that's cross-compiled to all the platforms, uh, we can basically use this tool on all the platforms, again, out of the box. We don't have to uh, worry about uh, a single platform that's being used, and we don't have to ask people to use one platform or the other. It just works on all of them. All right. So to quickly summarize, we have realized that we have a set of well-defined stages that adhere to a certain API. And once we realized that, we were able to isolate those different phases or the different stages into Docker executions. Uh, and by doing that, we basically streamlined the developer experience for all the different platforms. They no longer have to worry about installing Docker or separate tooling. And we made it a lot more native, or we gave it a, a better, better feel than it was before. So looking forward, where, where are we thinking to take Newt uh, from now? We've been experimenting with doc generation as one of the steps for, for the development pipeline. What that means is that in addition to build, we also have a stage that takes markdown files uh, and converts them into a static site. For that, we're using a tool called MakeDocs. Uh, it's a Python tool, it works really great, and the fact that it's now in Python is no longer relevant. We can use whatever tool is, we, we like most, and we have the container that is set up exactly in a way that would make it work on all machines. Uh, one other cool aspect of using MakeDocs is that it allows you to run um, a native, or sorry, uh, a live preview of your MakeDoc files. Basically, um, you, run it, you run a server inside the container, and then you put up a browser in your, in your laptop to see the changes live. You make a change to the markdown, you see the change live hosted from the container. Once you're happy with that, again, you throw away the container, it's like you never had Python in your computer, and you can push up the markdown and the HTML that was generated from it. Another thing that we've been thinking about but haven't really started implementing is basically running containerized system tests. Because we now know we have a single tool that installs Docker, we can leverage that fact to run integration tests that require, I don't know, MySQL or Redis or something else that needs to be present or other services. Um, this, is, this would be very similar to how Docker Compose works or pods in some cases, but because we have an internal implementation of of Docker um, at Netflix, this would probably have, would take a different flavor. We still kind of need to see where that goes. But this is a very interesting direction that we'd like to take. And we feel like we've only just scratched the surface of what you can do with uh, Docker as part of the development experience. Uh, I'd love to brainstorm with anyone who is interested to talk about the potential uh, directions we can take it in. Uh, we are not currently thinking about open sourcing it, but if there is interest, I'm happy to discuss and see if maybe we can work on this together. Um, and that's it. Uh, happy to take questions if you have any. Good question. So the question was, um, are we considering not open sourcing because it's stuff that's specific to Netflix? And the answer is because we're basically uh, abstracting everything in a Docker container, it doesn't really matter what the implementation is. We could provide an open source tool that just knows how to do all the scaff or you know, install Docker, run the container, uh, deal with aliases and defining custom commands and app types and then basically leave the, the Docker container implementation to our users. We could potentially also have a registry that's you know, maintained by the community, uh, but again, those are details that we kind of need to hash out. Yeah. 
the question was, what's the adoption rate at Netflix? And the answer is complicated. Um, I would say a few hundreds of developers. I don't have the exact number because uh, it's hard to differentiate right now between whether it's a Jenkins slave that's running Newt or if it's a developer, but we have at least a couple of hundreds that are currently using it. We've only released it a couple of months ago. So, yeah. So, yeah, so the question is how do we deal with deviations from the paved road, so to speak, right? How do we enable uh, customers to change the Java version or to do things a bit differently than what we do in the containers? So, with respect to Java tooling, this is not specifically something that we enforce. People can choose whatever they want, and in fact, when they develop on their local machine, it all happens inside of their machine. It doesn't happen in a Docker container. I was specifically referring to you know, packaging and publishing. Uh, but suppose this was an issue, and let's say they wanted to use a, uh, a different tool to package their Debian's, or maybe they wanted to package it in a different way, then I would tell them to, you know, Take, they have that freedom, but then they have to take the responsibility to basically create and maintain the Docker image that does it. Yeah. The Debian packaging that you showed us, uh, can you compare it with the. So the question was, can we uh, build an AMI with Newt and deploy to production? Okay. So in our process, and maybe I wasn't clear about this before, we basically, once we ship out the Debian to Artifactory, another system kicks in, which we call the bakery, and that system uh, takes the Debian and bakes it onto the base AMI. So this is not something that happens within you. This is our standard pipeline. You take the you take the Debian, you bake it onto the AMI, and then that's what that's the immutable uh, artifact that gets shipped to uh, to Amazon. So the question was, do we feel concerned with building locally inside containers versus running in a central managed environment? That's a good question, and we go back and forth on this a lot. Um, traditional thinking says that we have to do it in Jenkins because we don't trust developers to do the right thing, and that they could screw up stuff in production. That said, um, we could also maintain the build containers that you know basically run the builds and create the artifacts. So it doesn't have to be the developers. And also, again, we have the FNR, or the freedom and responsibility culture, which means if you choose to do this, right, you have to own it, right? If you choose to do this and it doesn't work and you screwed it up, then you have to own it. When they paid you at three in the morning, it's gonna be you, it's not gonna be anyone else. Yeah, so for specifically for development, when we run Newt exec some tool, it installs the right version based on whatever metadata you have for Newt. Um, so it works very similarly to RVM, NVM, all those things that download distributions for you and set the path. Uh, we also do it for Go tooling, we're doing it for Go, we're doing it for the Nebula distribution, lots of other tools that we have access to. All right, thank you very much.